Welcome to Deep Dive at Five. I am Jeff Robinson here with my friend Larry Starkey. And welcome once again if you are a deep diver, a long veteran deep diver uh, with us on this uh, this presentation, this video cast, basically uh, here at Grace Fellowship. What we did at the uh, beginning of starting three on-campus, in-person services, as we want to try to emphasize that as much as we can. So we thought it may be best to really uh, reconfigure and refocus Deep Dive for a monthly Deep Dive, where we can take kind of that series and what we talked about that month and just try to focus in and be as sharp as we possibly can. So welcome to this month's December 2020, the last month in the decade known as 2020 to, uh, to deep dive at five. We're so glad that you're here with us. And if this is your first time, we welcome you. Uh, what we do here is we take what we talked about on Sunday and really, I guess, Larry, the past several weeks yeah. in our series, and we try to take that and dissect mm -hmm. it and go a little bit deeper for those of us that enjoy thinking uh, and loving the Lord with mm -hmm. all of our mind, all of our hearts. Mm -hmm. And we also talk about ways to apply uh, the word of God to our lives. And so whether you're a follower of Christ or maybe you're you're a person uh, who is seeking, seeking out truth, looking at religion and faith or science or whatever may be on that spectrum, we want to welcome you into the discussion here uh, this afternoon. And, uh, and hopefully this is encouraging and helpful to you in your uh, faith journey. Now, just this past Sunday, Larry gave an incredible, well, actually, you gave it three times uh, on Sunday, uh, a teaching on God's Word from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 about the love of God. And Larry, great mm. job. It was Thank just you. a in, tremendous treatment of God's Word and the way you handled the text. And what was really cool is how you applied it in so mm. many different ways mm. um, to the way that we, that we live our lives. Thank you. It was an honor always to preach God's Word. And I love that 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. It just reminds me the Bible is God's living word. You can read that chapter 20 times and the Holy Spirit can pick out different things, apply yeah. it in different ways, depending on what season of life you're going through as you read it. And uh, But thanks for the opportunity to preach mm -hmm. and uh, love it. If you're not familiar with 1 Corinthians 13, read it. It's only 13 verses long, but it's life-changing stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, talking about uh, the topic of love and in the name of love, that was the name of our series. Let me jump in with a question, if that's yep, okay. In the name of love. It wasn't based on you too, but Bono actually got his stuff from the Bible, not the way around. That's right. So just to clarify, clarify that, <laughs> deep dive. So most religions will place some degree of emphasis on love. Mm -hmm. Christianity certainly uh, places an emphasis on love. But yeah. as you taught in the series and as um, we learned through that 1 Corinthians 13 study, the Christian concept of love, agape, is unique compared with other right. religions. So the question is, how is the Christian concept of agape love different from other religions' concept of love? Mm. Well, first, when we say agape love, we've discussed this before in, in our sermons and, and even here at Deep Dive. It's, mm. it's a general descriptive term in the New Testament specifically of God's love for us, yeah. namely the act of self-sacrifice by which Jesus, the Son of God, came into this broken world and gave his life for us. Yeah. Um, but maybe a, a word here for those of us that are followers of Christ that enjoy word studies. Um, agape is, it seems to be in the, in the New Testament that was written in the Greek language, the most, uh, the clearest description of the love of God, but we always want to be careful with word studies as well. Yeah. And Larry, I know you taught a lot about this with your Wednesday night group and mm -hmm. with the Brian Christian School to be careful, uh, even when we use uh, words from the Bible or Hebrew words in the Old Testament, Greek words from the New Testament say this word means, well, in a sense, but there's always the context, right? Mm -hmm. Context yeah. is king. So even in English, we can say, I'm going to present the present at the present time. <laughs> and so, you know, if, if you're like learning English, well, what does the word present mean? Well, it depends on, yeah. on context. Yeah. And uh, so, so we would just say that, but again, agape is just the sharpest way that we can see in scripture to describe the love uh, of God. Mm -hmm. In Christianity, Larry, to answer your question directly, what stands out or what distinguishes the Christian concept of agape love from other religions, I think a large part of it's found in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, where it says, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation 
Big word, mm -hmm. propitiation for our sins. And propitiation mm -hmm. basically means the substitute. Mm -hmm. To where Jesus came and was the substitute for the justice and the wrath that we all deserve. That mm -hmm. he took my place, that he took our place. And so in Christianity we see the holy, the righteous, the perfect, the blameless, the flawless coming and absorbing the punishment for those mm -hmm. who deserved it. That is distinctly Christian. Yeah. Yeah. And we could talk, and we've had a lot of conversations about different religions, and so even the question here is like as broad as it could possibly get. <laughs> Thanks for that, Larry. Um, but maybe just a couple of thoughts about a couple of different religions. Mm -hmm. And obviously we could talk about this for literally uh, weeks on end, but one would be um, from Islam. Mm -hmm. uh, each chapter in the Quran, each surah, begins with the phrase, in the name of Allah, the compassionate, the merciful. Mm -hmm. But it's fascinating that when you read the Quran or when you look at just Islamic scholars in general, what illustrations, what specific stories, uh, what, uh, it, like what data do you find in the Quran of God actually demonstrating in an, obser in an observable, real life way, compassion mm -hmm. and mercy? Mm -hmm. What we actually find in the, um, in the Quran is that Allah loves the righteous, but not the wicked. Mm. Um, I interviewed an imam several years ago, Larry, went to a mosque and had a great conversation there uh, with him. And he said, I said, this seems to be my general reading of the Quran, that Allah uh, loves those that are righteous, but does not love those who are not righteous. And he said, that is exactly my reading and the mm. general reading of uh, Islamic scholars, that mm. God does not love the wicked. But Jesus, mm. when Jesus talked about love in Matthew, if you guys remember Matthew chapter mm. 5, verses 46 and 47, and Jesus is talking and he says, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Mm. Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And he's not mm. talking about like some you know, IRS agent trying to do his or her job. He's talking about people who are professional cheaters, yeah. like people who would cheat their own grandmother out of a social security <laughs> check. He's not talking about like just white collar professionals or a CPA. Yeah. He's talking about people that were morally corrupt. Yeah. He said, so according to Jesus, now think about this. If you only love those that are lovable, if you only love those that love you, you have a morally deficient form of love. Mm. And in verse 47, Jesus says, and if you greet only your brothers, people like you, people who have things in similar uh, similarities with you, what more are you doing with others uh, than others? And then Jesus just drops a bomb. He says, do not even the Gentiles do the same. Oh, and you can imagine the Jewish audience there like, no way, Jesus just didn't do that. Did he just say that if we don't love people who do, like if we're not willing to show love to people who don't necessarily love us first or love us in return, that we're the same as, oh, God forbid, Gentiles? Mm. That's exactly where Jesus went. Yep. So according to Jesus, a love that only loves those who love you, that's a deficient, or you could say like an anemic, yeah. weak, corrupted uh, version of love. God's love, on the other hand, the agape love, is that while we were still sinners, yeah. Christ mm. died for us. Mm. And when you study the history of the Christian church, down through the centuries, all different cultures, um, you see the persecution stories of the church and how the love of God transformed people to even mm. love and pray for their persecutors. And that's what we often find, mm. Larry, throughout the centuries where Christians would, would say, obviously pray for us to the other believers, but also pray for our persecutors. Wow. And that's something that is, only, that is unique to Christianity. Yeah. Uh, another... Uh, thought here would be with Buddhism, uh, the quest for whatever whatever uh, version or school of thought within Buddhism, there, and there are many, mm -hmm. the quest for enlightenment is, is qualitatively, think about this, that's the point for you to find enlightenment, it's qualitatively focused on your own enlightenment. Mm -hmm. It is self-focused. Mm -hmm. The love of God is others focused, right? Again, in this, we know that God is love, that, that he laid down his life for us. So in Christianity, 
we come to Jesus to escape the wrath of God, mm -hmm. the justice of God. We come to Jesus to experience the forgiveness of God. But in that rescue, in becoming a Christian, in, in turning from our sin, we receive a new heart, a new mind. Uh, we've been given a new identity in Jesus Christ. And the way that we live that out is in service to God by serving other people and giving our lives away. Yeah. So there's such a clear contrast. And by the way, for, uh, for many um, younger Americans, Buddhism seems to be more and more attractive, mm -hmm. at least a neural type of, of Buddhism. If, you've, uh, if you guys have seen David Brooks' article on that for our super nerds out there, very popular mm -hmm. uh, conception today on how to find your own you know, nirvana and uh, enlightenment. But all that to say is that within Buddhism, the quest is to help yourself. It's self-help, self-focused, where the gospel is others-focused. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, in Hinduism, the concept of samsara or rebirth or reincarnation, there is no concept of grace. There's no concept really of love, Larry. Mm. The way you work off your past misdeeds or your past mistakes, bad karma, whatever tag you want to put on that, is you have to suffer. In other words, in Hinduism, mm. It's just a, uh, like a machine. It's a mechanistic wheel of suffering. There is no grace. There, none of it. Not one molecule of grace in the Hindu universe, if in fact that's true. And so there's not even the place for what we could call genuinely the love of God to come and give us what we need but what we can't actually deserve. So, again, we could talk about this for days and weeks on mm. end, but those are maybe a few thoughts, Larry, uh, mm in a way of con contrasting the love of God with um, the concept of love mm -hmm. in other religions. It's amazing because so many people make the mistake of just thinking that pretty much religions all say the same thing, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, right. whatever, like the ones that right. you mentioned. But it doesn't take a whole lot of digging to realize that's simply not the case. A lot of people right. think that religions say pretty much the same thing on the major stuff and they differ in the minor things. The exact opposite is true. Mm. As you just pointed out, mm. something as as basic, as significant, as foundational as God's love for us, as you just pointed out, there are major differences right. between some of the major religions. So again, it's worth your while if you're open to Christ and Christianity and mm -hmm. open-minded toward truth, pursue it, look at it. You don't have mm -hmm. to be an expert. You don't have to look too hard. I mean, you just summarized in a matter of a few minutes. I mean, something, again, as significant as how different religions mm -hmm. view love and how Christ Christianity is unique with that concept of agape. Thank you for that, yeah. uh, that explanation. It made it clear and um, you get to choose. <laughs> well, another thought, Larry, based on, on your thought about the, the fundamental difference between Christianity and every other world religion yeah. is, and we don't, we don't say this because, look, there's a, there's a ton of things that I do not know. Let me just say that. Like I'm trying to learn all the time. But maybe if that's where we are right now in our view, uh, or maybe where, where you find yourself of religion or faith in general, it's, you know, it's kind of one God and, you know, we just kind of have different ways to get there and it's all kind of the same thing. C.S. Lewis um, asked a question, I forget which book it was in, but basically if you believe that, how much religion have you, and again, we say this with humility, how much religion have you actually read? Have you actually read uh, the the Vedas or the Vedas? You know, have you actually read the writings of the Buddha? Mm -hmm. Have you read the Buddhist scripture? Have you read the Quran? Have you read the Bible? And when you read them, did you actually pay attention? Again, we're not trying to say that because I haven't like read everything. Right. You know, and again, there's so much stuff that you read. Like, what, what did I just read? But we're just saying for us to be to be honest in where we are and with these huge, weighty, important, life-changing questions, let's be careful not just to flippantly throw out something that we saw on a meme on yeah. Instagram yeah. that had, you know, like a picture with all these different pathways going to this one, you know, like shadow or cloud. Well, it's all the same. I saw it on Instagram. Well, I mean, is that, is that actually, and here's the thing, guys, we know better, but it's helpful just to stop once in a while and actually think, is what I'm saying something I've actually thought about? Have I actually right. been willing to see, does, is what I've heard my whole life or my grandmother say or my best friend, do I just repeat what they say, or have I actually thought about this and tried to find what's, uh, what's most meaningful and what's true? Yeah. And, and once you've um, explored, like Pastor Jeff was just saying, 
at some point you've got to decide what you're going to believe. If you don't find Christianity's response um, satisfying, that's your choice. But you have to believe something. So is mm -hmm. what you're going to believe better than that? Is it more truthful than that? Mm -hmm. and I think that's the challenge is Absolutely. explore and then make a decision. Yeah. Um, and so uh, again, for me, and I know for you, we have in our exploration discovered that Christianity is true and satisfying. We still have questions, but just because we don't have all the answers doesn't mean we don't have any answers. And mm -hmm. the answers we do have are enough to um, motivate us to put our faith in God and trust Him with those questions that we don't yet have answered. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, explore and then decide. And if you choose against Christianity, again, that's your choice. But what are you going to pick? You have to believe something. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh. that, there's so many places I think we both want to go right now. We've only <laughs> answered like, or at least taken a chance to address one question. I'm going to say we answer. We try to address it. Let me ask a question to you, Larry. So let's say a person has actually come to un actually understand what Scripture teaches about the love of God. Why is it so hard for some of us to actually accept what Scripture clearly teaches? Yeah, it's love can be such a it is such a such a powerful thing, right? And uh, so a lot of people just find it difficult to accept this degree of love that the Bible describes that God has for us. And I do think there's a couple of reasons. Mm -hmm. I think um, there's an intellectual reason. And I also think there's a very personal, you could even say emotional reason. Mm -hmm. Let me talk about the intellectual reason first. And I think it's simply this. Many times we fail to understand what God's love means as it's given to us in Scripture. Um, so we've defined it as agape, or Scripture defines it as agape. Um, Paul, in his writings in the New Testament, several times in Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians and other times, um, he would pray for the people he was writing to. And it's amazing when you read those prayers of Paul, how many times in the mix of all those prayers, there's the request that God would help his readers, the people he was writing to, understand God's love, to wow. comprehend God's love. So I do think there's an intellectual part that hinders us from understanding what God's love uh, really is all about. Um, you read from 1 John 4 a moment ago. I'm, I'd like to go back to 1 John 4 as well and read verse 8 because I think if we can grasp mm. this truth that I'm about to tell you, then you will have um, a, a pretty good intellectual understanding of what God's love is all about, what it means. 1 John 4, 8 says just three words. God is love. God is love. Now, what that tells us is that God does more than just feel love, and God does more than just express love. When Scripture says God is love, it means that love is part of His nature. It's part of His core essence. It doesn't just say God loves. It says God is love. Now, let that sink in for a moment, because here are the ramifications of that. Here are the implications from that. Because God is love, that means that His love for you and for me is uninfluenced by anything about you or me. In other words, God loves you not because of who you are, but He loves you because of who He is. He is love. And so let's get real practical. That means that there is nothing that you can do to make God love you more. Hmm. He is love. And there's nothing that you can do to make God love you less <laughs> mm -hmm. because God is love. God loves you right now as much as he could possibly love you. Mm -hmm. When you die and you are in heaven or you're on the new heavens and the new earth, 10,000 years from now, let's say, God will not love you anymore. He cannot love you anymore at that time than he loves you right now. He loves you as much as he could possibly love you right now. And let's get really, really practical. When I say that you can't do anything to make God love you more or to make, you God, make God love you less, let's imagine that tomorrow um, you have the greatest spiritual mountaintop day you've ever had in your life. You read 20 chapters of the Bible, you pray for three hours, you witness to 20 people and all 20 of them accept Christ. <laughs> well, that night, tomorrow night, when your head hits the pillow, let's just say that for discussion's sake, 10 is the highest level that God could possibly love you at. There's no number mm -hmm. above 10, just for discussion's sake. When your, head hits, when your head hits the pillow at the end of that spiritual mountaintop day, God loves you at a 10. Mm. But let's say the day after tomorrow, you have one of the worst spiritual valley days you've ever had. I mean, it feels like the whole day you did nothing but sin. <laughs> have you ever had a day like that? Where, I mean, you just fight your flesh, you fight the devil, and uh, it just seems like it's one step forward and then two steps back. 
I think According? most of us could say yes, and the ones of us that say no, we just committed a pro, uh, another sin. It's called yep. lying or hypocrisy. There's a, yeah, so yeah, we're with you, Larry. So when your head hits the pillow at the end of that spiritual valley day, God still loves you at a 10. Because he loves you not based on your performance. His love is not conditioned by your performance. He loves you, again, not because of who you are or what you do. He loves because of who he is. God is love. Now, let me just clarify. That doesn't mean that God approves of everything that we do, okay? Mm -hmm. But here's where it gets really good. When we really understand and experience, which I'll mention here in just a minute, when we really understand and experience God's love for us, it doesn't become a license to disobey. It's not like, oh, God loves me. I can go out and do anything I want. It's the opposite. It's that I am so um, enraptured with the idea that God loves me um, because of who he is. And whether I have a good day or a bad day, nothing changes that love. That motivates me to want to live for him. Mm. It doesn't make me want to sin against him. It makes me want to uh, love him back and mm -hmm. to serve him and obey him all the more. Let me give you a quick example from scripture. I won't read the whole story, but if you go back to John chapter 8, you'll read the story about the woman who had been caught in adultery. Now, you can read the story for yourself, but let me skip to the end of it. So the men who had accused the woman of this, they were wanting Jesus to give permission to stone her and all this, mm -hmm. and Jesus did some things and caused them to walk away in shame. You can read it for yourself. Mm -hmm. But here's where Jesus addresses the woman caught in adultery. He says to her, where are your accusers? Now watch this. She says, there aren't any. They've left. And then watch this. Jesus says, neither do I condemn you go and sin no more. Notice he doesn't say, go and sin no more, neither do I accuse you. Mm. He first of all said, I love you. Mm. I accept you in my love, and it's because of that mm. you can now go and sin no more. Mm. So when she recognized how much she was loved by Jesus, even being caught in the middle of that sin, that was the motivation that Jesus mm. was saying, now you don't have to go out and keep committing that sin. Now that you know you're accepted, now that you know that you're loved, now mm -hmm. that you know that my love for you has nothing to do with you and it has to do because God is love, that's the motivation now for you to go out and you don't have to commit that sin anymore. Mm -hmm. So I accept you, I love you, neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. So the fact that God is love, again, reminds us that he loves us not because of who we are but because of who he is and that's motivation for us then to want to obey him because of this great love that he has for us and that his love is not conditioned on our performance. His love um, is not, you know, um, dependent on whether we, you know, love him back and that kind of thing. So I do think when we understand on an intellectual basis that we're secure in his mm -hmm. love. Now this I would like to read to you, Romans 8 uh, verses 38 and 39. Listen to this, how Paul describes how secure we are in God's love. Mm -hmm. Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's like Paul was stretching his imagination, wow. exhausting his vocabulary, trying to imagine a scenario mm -hmm. in which God wouldn't love us. Mm -hmm. And he can't imagine a scenario mm -hmm. in which God would not love us. Mm -hmm. Why? Because God is love and he loves us not because of who we are, but because of who he is. So I think, number one, a reason why yeah. people struggle with accepting God's love is they don't understand that. They think they have mm -hmm. to earn it. They think it's conditioned on their performance and so forth. And then just real quickly, I think that leads me to the second reason why people struggle with accepting God's love, and those are personal reasons, like we're consumed with guilt. How could mm -hmm. God ever love me because I'm so guilty? Or legalism. Some people think Christianity is all about rules and regulations. Right. has nothing to do with God loving us. Um, I think a real key reason is that we rarely experience agape love in our human relationships. Mm. So we've not seen this kind of love before that the Bible describes. And, um, and so I think that's another reason is we just can't imagine it. We don't feel like we're worthy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so those are kind of personal, emotional reasons why people have a hard time yeah. accepting the fact that God loves them. But let me remind you, and I'll kind of wrap up my comment with this. Mm -hmm. This kind of love that we're talking about, this kind of love that the Bible describes, it is supernatural love. 
You know, it's a love that God and God alone can have. And then once you've experienced God's love in your own life, you can then express it to other people. Mm -hmm. So again, just kind of wrap up my mm -hmm. uh, response. Why do people struggle with accepting God's love? Number one, they don't accept or don't understand, I should say, on an intellectual level that God is love. So his love for you has nothing to do with who you are. It has everything to do with who he is. And then secondly, just on that emotional, personal level, whether it's guilt or legalism or because we've not experienced it in our human relations, mm -hmm. uh, relationships, we have a hard time accepting it. But again, remember, it's a supernatural love that you can only really get from God. Mm. Yeah. That's, that's profound. <laughs> that's profound. That's great, great stuff, Larry. And uh, I, I love Romans 8. The yeah. way that it ends oh. about, he just describes what, what you just read, <laughs> all those different things that cannot separate us from the love of God. Because a lot of times I think those are the points where we hit uh, in our life when we say, well, this has happened or there's this reality in the world. And so that has separated me from the love of God based on my own perception or mm -hmm. my pattern of behavior. But Paul says, no, it, it can't. Yep, that's right. And that love is what motivates us to then obey yeah. in the love and in the power of Christ. Mm -hmm. So let me change the question a little bit. Now that we've kind of established, hopefully, a little bit of what love is, um, how can love change us mm -hmm. and thus change the way that we love others? We've talked a bit about experiencing God's love, yeah. but how does that affect us and change the way that we then love others? Mm -hmm. Well, first I would say that God's love changes our perception and our view of ourselves. Yeah. That outside of Christ, it's almost a natural default to where we are, are self-focused. Yeah. Um, but the, the love of God, it aligns our, the view of ourself with reality, and that humbles us. Yep. So I would say that the love of God uh, humbles us in the sense that it bows us before God, um, just to know that He is, he is absolutely holy, righteous, without blemish, mm -hmm. and that sin... Uh, is exceedingly horrific and God's nature is such that it's so so separate and so other than sin and, and wickedness and evil and perversion and hatred and greed and like every other you know every other terrible thing but that that God who is so holy has has shown and given his love to me mm. And to see our sin not in relation to other people, like, well, I'm not doing drive-bys or I'm not, you know, <laughs> selling heroin to kids. You know, like that, that's a natural human reaction to when, when we're confronted with our own sin. We say, well, you know, compared to, I'm not, I'm just as good as the next person, you know, on, on the bus or, you know, my street or whatever. But that's not the right uh, reference point. The correct reference point is God. And so I would say that, that God's love changes us in the sense that it changes our, our self-perception. Um, and also God's love with that, it lifts us up. Yes. So on one hand, it, it humbles us before God. But on the other hand, it, it, it lifts us up because mm. he is the one who has chosen to lavish his love upon us. Mm. That, that now mm. I'm not a child of wrath. I'm a child of the king. Yeah. I mean, now I'm not defined by my sins or my proclivities or my addictions. I now have a new identity in Jesus Christ. And, I'm, and because of that, I'm fully accepted. Amen. And that's what we, I think most of us in life, we're, we're looking for acceptance. Yep. And that's not a bad thing, right? It's like, it's, it's, it's like, no, I don't want to be accepted by anybody. I don't want any relationship <laughs> in my life. Like that, that's an issue. Like it's not a bad thing to want to be accepted. But in the gospel, in the love of God, we find, and it's so, it's so cool, that we're fully and completely known. Mm -hmm. That God sees everything. He knows what's in every dark nook and cranny and in the basement and in the attic. And he knows what's in between the walls in South Florida. It's probably water damage. You know, <laughs> like, you know like he, he knows everything about us. But yet he has still chosen his posture towards us is love yeah. to his children. I think that's just, that's a tremendous change yep. in not only the way we view the world, but I mean, that affects our emotions, Absolutely. the way that we feel towards God, yep. the way that, uh, that we feel towards others. And the Bible talks about sanctification, that we grow more like Jesus. So yep. it may be that we're uh, a new Christian and we're, we're seeing some of these things the Lord is developing in our lives that we know that we should have a different <laughs> posture, maybe in our heart towards certain people. Um, but that, that will come yep. um, as we continue to grow um, towards the Lord. But, you, but the way the world is and the way our flesh, our natural 
um, heart position is outside of Christ is that our hearts are lifted up and puffed up against God yeah. rather than being bowed down towards God. And then we actually bow down towards lesser things. Yeah. We serve power or, or sex or our personal, you know, uh, circumstantial happiness. And you can find that in the Bible. It uses the phrase uh, with certain people like Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 5, uh, 20. It says his heart became puffed up yeah. uh, against the Lord. So yeah. the gospel mm. and the love of God reverses all that and really sets us in, in the <clears throat> right alignment. It's, I mean, it's sort of like going to the chiropractor where we get realigned. And I usually tell my chiropractor, I say, you are a hilarious guy because you crack me up every time. <laughs> he gets, I think the joke is old by now. Um, <laughs> But the, the love of God, it sets the tone also for how we exercise our love towards others. Yeah, uh, in a sense absolutely. of, even on Sunday, Larry, you referenced uh, Philippians 2, the mind of Christ. Yeah. So if, if you're trying to say, okay, well, right, Jeff, Larry, what, what does this look like um, with how I exercise my love towards others? would say, what is the posture of Jesus? Yeah. What would be his mindset? What, what would Jesus think? Think. And again, this is not something, well, I think Jesus would think. No, what has he said in Scripture? Mm. Um, specifically regarding unreciprocated love. Mm. Like if you're, let's talk family scenario. It doesn't have to, you know, you don't even have to be married. You can be married, single, single. Again, if you are experiencing in your closest relationships or what should be your closest relationships in life, love that you're trying to give, show, express in an appropriate way, in a God-honoring way, in a way that is, is healthy uh, for the other, the other person, but you're not really getting any of that in return. Say, okay, what, what would Jesus' posture be here? Mm -hmm. Because our natural fleshly response is, you don't give me respect, I'm going re to retract <laughs> my respect. You, know? you don't give me honor, I'm going to pull that back. You don't give me love in return, I'm going to cut it off. I'm just going to cut off the power supply, so to speak. Mm. But what we see in Jesus is the opposite of that. Yeah. And again, we're not talking about the absence of healthy boundaries. It's, again, we always have to clarify this. If it's an abusive situation, uh, you know, mentally, emotionally, or physically, we're not talking about the removing of healthy, uh, honestly, God-honoring um, guardrails there. We're talking about your heart condition towards other people. Mm. What is Jesus's posture towards a situation like this? How did Jesus behave towards the disciples mm. who Larry chronically, yeah. they didn't get it. <laughs> they didn't even get it until, like it, it was after the, after the resurrection. Like Jesus literally had to come to them in an upper room and they're all like, you know, lock the door and they're like, oh, <laughs> what's gonna happen? He's like, hey, like Jesus had to literally show up. But I just think of all of those times Jesus was with his disciples. They didn't get it. And he, Jesus is looking into their eyes. If you've ever been in that situation, the other person is sharing their perspective, and they do not get it. They <laughs> simply do not get their blind spots or how inconsiderate they are or rude they are. Or they, oh, my goodness, can they take a breath? Or that person that they basically have more in common with, like, an oak tree than they do humanity because they don't ever share anything. You're like, how are you? Great. You know, it's just like, no. So towards those situations, just remember that Jesus put up with people who didn't get it, but he mm -hmm. did it not because of what he was getting from them, but he did it out of love uh, for them and his passion for the glory uh, of his Father. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I just make a suggestion regarding enemies. Mm -hmm. How has Jesus given guidance on enemies? EGRs, that's called extra grace required. <laughs> Difficult people, people that just simply rub you the wrong way, they annoy you, or people who are like objectively they have some major issues and flaws and defects in their life. How has Jesus given guidance? We go back to Matthew 5. Jesus said, mm. pray for your enemies. Yeah. And in a sense, we say, well, why should I pray for my enemies? Stop. Right there, because what Jesus is doing, I think primarily, is giving us an opportunity to grow in our faith, mm -hmm. to grow more like Jesus and less like our enemies. Because if we don't take Jesus' approach to forgive, that means to entrust them to God and to pray for them, then we're going to eventually, gonna, we're going to be obsessed by our enemies because our thoughts are about them and how they wronged me and how evil mm -hmm. they are and how corrupt. And we're going to be there in our mind and our heart. We're not going to be with our family. We're not going to be at our job when we're actually at our job. We're not really going to be able to focus on the Word of God when we read it or when we hear it. 
Uh, and so when Jesus says to pray for your enemies, he's not necessarily like, oh, we just, you know, focus on them. What, he, what he's doing is he's giving us an out so we can have that recalibration, that readjustment mm -hmm. to the heart of God and the mind of God, mm -hmm. which again, what you read earlier in Romans 5, 8 as well, that he, he died for us and while we were still sinners yeah. died for us. So that's, that's what we could say the, uh, is, is the alignment and the change that the love of God brings uh, in mm. our lives. Oh, that's powerful. That's great. And I would say one more thing, uh, Larry, I've got one final question for you is for our guys, we, here's two guys, we're guys, we're talking about love, the love of God. A lot of times for our, for our men, we don't naturally lean into the parts of the Bible that deal with love, generally speaking. Yeah. Would you say that's true, yeah. Larry? For, for yeah. most of our guys, like we like, you know, the power of God and you know, the return of Jesus or the Old mm -hmm. Testament stories to where they're just, you know, <laughs> just taking care of the enemy. <laughs> um, so guys, if, if the love of God in scripture makes you a little bit uncomfortable, if you feel more drawn to like, you know, the, the power of God, the domination of God over all things, just remember that there's nothing more powerful than the love of God. Yeah. And Larry, you preached about this on Sunday, that mm. it's love that endures, it's love that holds us together. Mm. So if you really want to experience and learn about what's powerful, dive into, live in, study, ask God to build in your heart the love of God because love will allow you to endure, love will allow you mm. to last. Anything else is, is lesser. It's not going to be able to get you as far as the love of God because love endures all things. So I just want to just kind of put that little asterisk there, that little footnote for, for our guys um, relating to the love of God. Mm. Larry, one last question for you. How can a leader, such as a parent, employer, teacher, coach, etc., allow uh, the agape love of God to temper their authority as they lead others? I guess there's so many things to say about how we can love those who we lead. But I would say just one to the point thing, and that's this. You've got to start by making sure that you have experienced God's love for yourself. Mm. I've found that for myself as a leader. If I'm treating those who are following my leadership in a way that's less than the Lord would want me to, Every time, it's because mm -hmm. I realize for some reason I'm not experiencing God's love. I'm mm -hmm. not letting God, God's love into my life or to fill my, to fill my life. Um, so start with experiencing God's love. Listen to this key verse in 1 John 4, 19. We love because he first loved us. I mean, let that sink in. We love because he first loved us. So you can't love others the way God wants you to unless first of all you mm -hmm. have experienced his love for you. Mm -hmm. You can't give what you don't have. You can't express what you haven't experienced. We love because he first loved us. Mm -hmm. So again, I would, I would simply say that. I mean, there's a million other things we could say about you know, being a, a loving leader, but it's gotta start there. And that is making sure that you yourself has, have mm -hmm. opened yourself up to letting God's love fill your heart. Again, I'll yeah. come full circle to what I said a moment ago. That's why Paul in so many of his prayers included that. Lord, help these people experience, comprehend, you know, as much as they can your love for them. Then we'll be able to love others the way that God wants us to. Mm -hmm. um, I think if I could mention one other thing really briefly, I would say this, as much as you can, if you're a leader, start where your followers are in helping them and helping mm -hmm. them to grow and in instructing them and in leading them. If you're a parent, um, try to understand better where your child's coming from, if they're disobedient or if they're just being immature, right? If you're a coach and you have a player who's struggling with something, try to start where they are mm. and figure out what it is rather than just getting on mm -hmm. their case and it becoming about rules and regulations. You know, the stronger the relationship, the fewer rules and regulations you really need. Mm -hmm. So I would say start where they are as much as you can. And by the way, isn't that exactly what Jesus did with us. Yeah. He didn't wait until we became good enough to come to where he was. Mm -hmm. He started where we were. Mm -hmm. That Philippians 2 passage you mentioned a moment ago tells us he came to us. Mm -hmm. He became a human being. He became a servant. So he started where we were, so to speak, yeah. to become our savior and yes, the leader of our lives. 
So make sure that you are experiencing God's love. And if you find yourself being impatient with people, whether it's your own children or employees or students, if you're a teacher, if you find yourself, or I should say when you find yourself in that situation, just pause, pull over and just, Lord, please fill my heart and my mind with your love and love them through me. And then as best as you can, start where they are in your leadership. So there's a lot of other things, but I think that's the key. Again, you can't give what you don't have, so make sure you're experiencing God's love. Wow. Good word. Yeah. Good word. Well, guys, we hope that you've enjoyed this deep dive. I know it's been several weeks, but again, we're going to this new schedule. We'll do one of these per month so we can make it as sharp as we possibly can. And also, we want to extend an invitation to you guys if you're in the area and you haven't yet been to one of our in-person on-campus services. We're now fully on campus 8 30 10 and 11 30 a.m on sunday mornings we'd love for you to come out and here's the thing we've got so many of you guys have been so faithful and plugged in and just watching uh, and participating in worship from home online every single week we just ask that you seek the lord and pray and say lord when should my time to return uh be we don't want to make you i would larry i never want i don't want to make anybody i'm serious i don't want to make anybody do anything i want it to be of the lord from the holy spirit to you in your life so just ask the lord uh, when that time would be and if you are in the area or if you are somewhere else and you want to find out more about grace we're having our last virtual starting point this coming sunday at 1 30 p.m i'll be there larry will be there it'll be on zoom and so we would love to have you be a part of that all you have to do is go to our website gogracefellowship.org and there is a next steps tab there and you just click that and underneath there is starting point uh, virtual class and you can sign up that way and finally uh, if you're here in the area, we have our last beach baptism of the year, the week after on uh, on Sunday, December uh, the 12th. And so that'll be at Ocean Reef Park. We're excited about that. And it's just been so great to see almost every Sunday, Larry, as of late since we've reopened, uh, specific, specifically this fall, we've just seen men, women, and students mm-hmm. saying, I want to follow Jesus Christ. And they trust mm-hmm. him, they turn from their sin, and they say, I'm ready to go public with my faith, which is believer's baptism. Baptism. That means you have to become a believer, a trust, a person trusting in Christ first. Believer's baptism by immersion, put under the water, brought out of the water to picture the life, death, and the resurrection of, and the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So if you would like to be baptized at the beach or you have questions about Jesus or that, just questions about baptism, let us know. You can go to our website as well and or, or message us uh, on one of your uh, social media platforms. We would love to talk with you about following Jesus Christ. Grace, let's continue to keep the main thing the main thing. We love you. Larry, man, thank you so much for being here thank and you. again, sharing with us the Word of God on Sunday. It was a tremendous, thank tremendous you. message. And if you guys weren't able to be here on campus or online this past week, go to any of our channels and check out Larry's message. I know you'll be very encouraged and equipped. So may the Lord bless you. We look forward to seeing you this Sunday on campus or online. And then again next month for another deep dive. Have a great day.